on behalf of Peace uh, and myself, uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the attendees uh, from Denmark and, and elsewhere, and of course, uh, to today's guest speaker, Dr. Swati Parasha. This is the third seminar in a series focusing on how to conduct empirical research in countries or places affected by violent conflict or otherwise representing hostile, dangerous or devastating environments for people living or dying there. And also for the researchers, those of us who go there to document what's going on. During the first webinar in the series, Roddy Brett from the University of Bristol talked about how to face violence in the field. At the second webinar, Tamara last discussed the place of empathy and emotions uh, in field research. Uh, those of you who didn't attend these uh, seminars don't need to despair because they are available online. Today's talk and following discussion will focus on three issues. First, the often invisible actors in the research backstage, uh, such as the research brokers, the field navigators, the, the drivers, the assistants, the translators, all those people needed uh, for others to be able to carry out research. Second, the treatment of research in sites in the Global South by both Global North and South researchers. And finally, the ethical dilemmas and challenges of doing research during the corona pandemic. So the challenges involved, but also the opportunities for creating more ethical and sustainable research practices that the pandemic sort of have made visible to us. Before I present today's speaker, let me briefly explain the agenda and participation rules in this um, online format. The seminar is live streamed, but will, as the other seminars, also be available in a recorded version later. When we start, uh, Dr. Parasha will talk for some 30 minutes, after which she and I will have a brief discussion. Then we open up, not the floor, but the screen for comments and questions uh, from the audience. Unfortunately, this online format uh, we have chosen doesn't allow uh, for real life interaction. So those of you who wish to engage in the discussion, comment or ask questions, you should use the Q&A function, um, which you find at the bottom of the screen. And I will then do the best uh, to moderate uh, the discussion. I should also mention that good colleagues from the DEES conference department has helped set up the seminar and will assist with technicalities along the way. And today uh, we have with us event planner and uh, communication officer, Amelia Riesvi Skobo, uh, and without her, no event. So I'm confident that everything will run smoothly. So now let me introduce uh, today's guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Swati Parasha is director of the Gutenberg Center for Globalization and Development and an uh, associate professor at the School of Global Studies at the University in Gothenburg. Her re research and te teaching interests are in critical security and war studies, feminist and post-colonial international relations, women militants and combatants, gender, violence and development in South Asia. Um, her published work include the Women and Militant Wars book uh, published by Routledge in 2014, the Routledge Handbook of Feminist Peace Research co-authored with various uh, persons, and the Gender Silence and Agency in Contested territory, Territories uh, co-edited with Jane Parpat. Uh, she has also published uh, widely in, in highly ranked journals. You can find reference to all her work in, in the link provided at, at the webpage uh, announcing the seminar. So I won't uh, use time on, on that. What I will say is that she is also an investigator in, uh, attached to the collective research project exploring the research backstage, which is funded by the Swedish Research Council and from which I uh, expect part of today's talk will depart. 
So with these words of introduction, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Swati Parasha. Please, the screen is yours. Great, thank you, Nina. That's uh, that's wonderful, and it's great to be here. I know that ideally we'd like to say that it would be nice to meet in person. You know, it's strange to be talking to a screen, but on the other hand, uh, you know, several people may have joined us from different locations, and so in some sense, we are also glad that we have this space to discuss. Uh, these issues that matter to us as uh, academics, as social scientists, as uh, practitioners, policy makers. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that we would especially like to welcome today any students who have been able to join us, uh, who have had an incredibly difficult year and uh, are worried about uncertain futures and research trajectories. Um, let me, of course, first thank Nina because, you know, uh, we started this conversation and, you know, I accepted to speak, but I wasn't sure where this was going. And it was wonderful to chat with you yesterday about this long series of events that you want to do around this topic. So uh, really grateful to you and to the Danish Institute of International Studies for extending this very kind invitation. And certainly my great privilege and honor to be kind of even just being in this space. I can see a lot of familiar uh, faces, you know, names on the on the screen to my right in the participants list. So welcome everyone. OK, so Nina's already told you and you've uh, possibly had a chance to look at the publicity abstract. I did want uh, I, I did want to speak to three specific themes, which are, of course, interrelated. But there is there are two disclaimers first. And one is that reflections on field work and research are hard to generalize. Uh, one can learn from uh, different perspectives and experiences, and perhaps there are some lessons that are in common. Uh, but fieldwork is not easily generalizable. Uh, this is a field, uh, you know, where a lot of uh, thoughts, a lot of reflections are happening at the moment. But I think it is still very hard to kind of say that we have, we can have various theories of fieldwork. I, I would be a little bit cautious there. No manual, no ethics guidelines prepares one for what and for. So I think it's important to hold on to that uncertainty and to the very subjective experience of fieldwork. Secondly, and I know this is what we talk a lot, right? Like the corona pandemic, how things have been, you know, so difficult for all of us not having been able to go to places where we want to, you know, and uh, do our field work. But it is also important to point out that the pandemic is not the only way of losing lives, right? And it's important to turn the spotlight on to other inequalities and deaths. Uh, I know that we keep, uh, you know, flashing these figures, but statistics do very little to me. I think every death is important in that sense. Uh, but even if we were to just look at the numbers, if we actually look at how many people die of cholera or what happens uh, of, with, with malnutrition, what's happening in Yemen, for example, with, uh, with starvation deaths. Uh, I work on another project uh, funded by the Swedish Research Council on famines, and uh, they are staggering figures right so and and there, there are there there is we are in the midst of a, a, starv a midst of starvation deaths even now contemporary times uh, they have become part of war so you know there are other ways in which lives are lost and that that spotlight needs to kind of also focus on those deaths uh, and somehow the exceptionality of disease and death becomes comforting and it has been in this corona times when you can't exactly pinpoint the perpetrators right it's good to keep repeat repeating like a mantra that these deaths are exceptional and these are extraordinary times but of course they are in continuity you know the, the deaths that we have seen also uh, you know tell us about uh, how inequality functions, uh, even where deaths have occurred. Uh, so yes, that these are difficult times, but large parts of the world have been witnessing many deaths. Um, and as I mentioned, malaria deaths, for example, 90% of which occurs in sub-Saharan Africa, just because the geography of death changes, the deaths don't become more visible, more grievable. And that's the first point that I want to, uh, you know, my second disclaimer. This is not a global north and south problem alone. If you look at inequalities within global south countries as well, uh, what is visible, what is grievable? These are still questions to be asked. And uh, as most of you are aware, we had a terrible, we are still in the midst of a terrible second wave uh, corona in India, which is, uh, you know, where, from where I come and where I do my research as well. 
and where my family is. I mean, the, the discrepancy in how we, you know, the media has uh, put the spotlight on cities and, you know, the urban middle class and their suffering. Whereas I know with family in villages and how hard it is for people to even access, med you know, any kind of hospital. And there the media was trying to tell us that there's no, you know, there are no cremation grounds and there are no, uh, there are no uh, oxygen cylinders. I mean, the story from some other invisible parts are much more uh, harrowing. Okay, so based on those two disclaimers, then coming back to research, um, I was also thinking while I was, um, you know, kind of uh, putting my thoughts together, market, you know, always adapts quicker to the pan to any situation and even to the pandemic than we have as researchers, right? So I often see these uh, uh, advertisements for lung training device, you know, fancy masks. I mean, the mask market is huge right now, right? All sorts of art and craft and, you know, the, the way in which masks have been reinvented, oxygen cylinders, portable oximeters. I mean, there's, there's endless investment in creativity and thinking about making life easier. But obviously, we don't have the, those kinds of, uh, you know, facilities when we think about research. You know, we have not been that creative. So perhaps these seminars help us think about how we can also adapt ourselves to the new situation. So uh the three things right so the first thing that i want to address is the issue of research brokers uh and uh, there was a special issue that we also published uh, in in uh, civil wars a couple of years ago which you can access which has uh, a lot of reflections from scholars who work with research brokers but what do i mean here right so this is part of a conversation i've been having with colleagues uh, uh, you know uh, maria rickson bars and matt Sutas at Uppsala university and we we have had these this project running for three years we have paid attention to two or three sites sierra leone uh india and uh, and the drc and we are trying to see the ways in which research, research practices work and how we engage people on the ground. How do we treat our research collaborators? Uh, what knowledges are made visible? You know, what fieldwork practices and frames make intelligible the experiences of those who, uh, you know, we document in our research. So that's been the kind of motivation. And in some sense, there is an acknowledgement, of course, that we do not work alone. And very often we, you know, when we are published, you know, we have this uh, book waving at uh, people, we have these book launches uh, or whatever, whatever journal launches, we forget that we have not worked alone. Some, uh, some would say that research is like tribe building, that's a term that's been used. Others would say it is collective knowledge seeking, but the hierarchies are less visible, right? Uh, most of us work with uh, knowledge brokers, research brokers in the field as persons who facilitate re uh, field research. So you can call them brokers, fixers, facilitators, managers. Some people also use assistants, gatekeepers, interpreters, they are, uh, cri crisis managers, whatever term you want to use, right, depending on your context. But these are people who assist us in the field. Uh, and they are also persons who collect field data for researchers who are not at that time or ever in the field, right? Sometimes you can just outsource research and this is becoming common as even funding agencies have for a while now, I would argue, recognized remote data collection and compensation for local research partners to whom research can be outsourced. Uh, but of course, there are several issues with, with uh, research brokers, right? First is the silence, right? How do we understand the mechanisms uh, in some sense at play that uh, produce uh, this, this non-acknowledgement of research brokers in our research, right? What, what structures and conventions within the academic field, you know, how do they contribute to the silencing? And how do these play out in highly unequal relations of knowledge production? Uh, in fact, our recent project does something really interesting. We actually interview people. Uh, we, we, we actually are working with brokers in the field and uh, collaborators who are working with different brokers who are telling their stories. Uh, so we have uh, in some sense said that we don't want to be involved in this project because we don't want them to be influenced or feel that they can't tell their stories. But we actually want these facilitators or brokers to tell their own story. And we have uh, just had a you know book contract sort which is always good news but you know we are just involved at the periphery we are waiting to see what these stories will be and of course there are numerous blogs have been written about uh, the experiences 
But the important thing is, how do these silences uh, operate and, and to show us the mirror, we really, we really need that perspective to see, uh, you know, we are always writing about people. How do people write about us? How do people think about us as researchers, right? Now, broker contribution and impact is the is the next point. You know, when we talk about brokers, they do many different things in the field. What roles do they play? What tasks do they execute? In particular, what their own positionality does uh, in the research, particularly in relation to parties and conflicts. You have hired a broker. You are working in in a very sensitive area. You know, what kind of access do they have? You know, what what is their role in it? in our project right and how do they shape the research process and results right and then the third important point is what are their experiences right how do they navigate how do we together navigate uh, uh, you know this uh, attending power dynamics with with between us right how does the two sides how does this relationship impact um, uh, their security or that of their families, both in the actual field situation and afterwards. And this is uh, this is important because you know a number of brokers have risked their lives. Some have died. Um, I worked with someone in Sri Lanka, and uh, you know who uh, who worked. We worked under very difficult circumstances during my PhD when I was interviewing women in the LTT, and uh, it was 2008 when the war was still kind of ongoing, and it was very difficult because there was there were security threats to to the person who assisted me and so the relationship that we had and how did we kind of navigate that so the issue of brokerage i want to point out is a complex one research brokers are uh, knowledge managers linkage agents uh, you can call them capacity builders but but a researcher needs to be aware of biases and personal preferences of the broker in order to undertake any critical evaluation of the information and knowledge that is availed through the broker. That's of course an important part and we're all aware of it considering that's how we look at research participants as well. We don't just, we unpack what they say, right? Uh, there is also an understanding that brokers can be powerful, right? And I have found this in my own experiences, dictating terms of their engagement and, you know, uh, affecting outcomes and uh, affecting outcomes and also marginal and vulnerable figures they can be, who can be manipulated and exploited by researchers. And that's also a larger reality that we have uh, concluded through our project. Uh, and this is particularly noticeable with Global North researchers in the South and their treatment of both the site of their research and local research brokers, which we have been documenting in several publications, and I'll come to that in, in some, some examples. There's also an interesting uh, thing that goes on with brokers, which is the issue of you know the native informant and the insider outsider dilemmas right and i want to consider here the challenges that people like myself have to face and uh, i haven't had a chance to look at the list but i hope some of you are in my situation which is global south researchers who are based in the global north right and we avail of funding from global north institutions i'm funded by swedish research council i go back to india i work on the home states where i have spent some formative years of my life and it's really Really interesting when you go back as a foreign uh, university employee to do field work in the area that is also your native place right how do you navigate your native societies and of course there's much being written and reflected upon especially in ethnography the hierarchies are far more complex to navigate and you are both at uh, once the outsider and the insider the relationship to brokers can also vary as many uh, some may consider you of course the native informant and others may think you're privileged and naive and can be manipulated. And yet some others you can still end up having power over and dictate terms to. So so, so all, all of these play, play out, right? It's not a, a very unidimensional relationship. Uh, and, and so in some sense, there is multiple performances that goes on between the researcher and, and, and the research, uh, uh, between the broker. Many of us have written about how we are treated in the field vis-a-vis -vis, uh, white researchers. Uh, and uh, that is interesting because very often when we collaborate, you know, you're always uh, in the field with your colleagues and how that plays out for a Global South researcher. And that's a story that I'll just come to. But I remember a senior, uh, you know, African colleague, a researcher and uh, uh, 
uh, academic friend of mine was saying to me that when she was in the field and she was with her uh, white student, how the access uh, suddenly increased and how it was so much better with this white person in Africa, which is uh, not which is even which is difficult for an African to navigate. And I think most of us would say that uh, we have experienced it. I have myself experienced that that kind of situation. So uh, so that's important to consider. One important aspect to remember in all this is that there there is that many Global South researchers and academics such as myself, such as some of you also inadvertently get roped into broker roles, right? So somebody comes and says, you know, I want to go to India and I know you've done your work there. Can you help me? And so you inadvertently play that role. And that's also interesting. It has its own dynamics. My own uh, story is uh, of uh, working with a British uh, journalist who was also studying to for his PhD. Uh, several years ago now and uh, so he uh, wrote to me saying that you know I know you work on this and I know you are in the field so can you help me and of course you want to do the right thing because you've also benefited from other people helping you and there he was expecting me to provide him accommodation arrange interviews find him western food in a small city he wanted pasta and you know all the usual thing you you have to do translations I ended up translating I was frustrated but that he wasn't prepared with the language he didn't hire some somebody to help him with. So he wanted me every time there was a conversation to do translations and during the interview and that was the annoying part of it and finally which something i never forgot there were many many stories and i've never documented it but i was thinking today when he was leaving at the airport he says oh it was so lovely to have you help me but now i return to civilization he was going back to london so I thought, OK, and, and of course, throughout, he was very interested in telling me that, oh, I understand the problem, but where is the poverty? I want to see poverty because that's the reason why you have the Maoist conflict in these areas, you know, without the nuances and backing anything. Not to mention that uh, a lot of, um, you know, reports that he should not have people that he should not have outed. He took their names in his reports, which also created a lot of problem. Moral of the story, when you are going with journalists in the field, be very, very careful. You know, that's that's a different kind of ethics that they work with. The irony is that most important people in the field would respond uh, to his requests for interviews than to mine. And this is akin to what my uh, African colleague experienced. Uh, and there was a particular interesting experience where, you know, the, the, the statue of a particular freedom fighter, indigenous person had to be garlanded. And he was uh, invited to do it. And I just was, it was a, it was a very interesting post-colonial moment watching this, you know, British guy uh, being asked to, you know, garland a statue of someone who had fought the British and had died young and was uh, brutally killed. Uh, anyway, so as an Indian woman from that region, I stood lower in the hierarchy compared to the white English man who had access, privilege, also public acceptance as a credible researcher much more than I did. Uh, so there is an intersectional hierarchy based on gender, class, race, etc., whatever else that be that operates in the research backstage that we need to start paying attention to. And uh, we can come to some of this uh, in, in a bit when we uh, in Q&A or perhaps later. My second point is about the treatment of research sites in the Global South by both Global North and South researchers. And this is something I want to emphasize. So fieldwork practices and the politics of expertise that not only thrive on the labor of the racialized other that we know as research subjects, as assistants, as brokers, but also how we treat locations in the Global South as case study sites on which Western and Eurocentric theories are applied, right? And this has been my frustration for a very long time. I mean, the way academia is organized, I have worked mostly in Western countries and it's always like, oh, I have a theory. Theory comes from here, but I have a case study site that is somewhere in the Global South. I don't think we are thinking through that well. This hierarchy of theory and case study. I actually always wanted to write a paper, Global South as case study. Uh, and I will at some point, but, uh, you know, it has resulted in a very unequal and exploitative academic fieldwork industry where Global South sites are mediated through understandings of statehood and nation states. It's often like you don't even get the regional variations and you just take the borders literally and you're like, I'm working on Myanmar or Bangladesh or India, you know, and you don't get the dynamics. It's just a site at the end of the day. And, and these sites remain permanently suspended in a state of conflict, right? The spatial 
other, if you like, uh, who is lagging behind on development indicators and therefore, you know, in need of rescuing and, uh, you know, it being made intelligible through frameworks and practices that emanate from the global north. Uh, at the very least, this would mean doing away with this theory case study model and recognizing that all phenomena in the global south have their own theoretical foundations, developments, uh, explanatory trajectories, you know, all of that. And very sophisticated alternative, uh, I wouldn't like to use the alternative uh, the word as a word but very uh, sound uh, sophisticated knowledge systems through which you can understand the events there uh, moreover it would also mean recognizing the complex challenges of fieldwork in global south sites and learning and unlearning from available reflections so that's really important Right. So I would say in the last few years, of course, there has this has been an industry, right? The proliferation of fieldwork supported research go to the global south and IR actually the discipline in which I was trained and I did my PhD in was not a very fieldwork oriented discipline like like perhaps history or perhaps anthropology, sociology. But IR has also started doing this, right? And feminists and post-colonial scholars emphasize, right? Centering people into an analysis, right? Thinking about lived experiences, how they need, that needs to take precedence, uh, 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 you know, people-centric research projects, right? Outside the global north, you know, focusing on that. So there's been a lot of that. But at the same time, and it's a good thing, I would say, it's a good thing that IR folks wants to go want to go out and explore things out there about the world that they're writing but this has also unleashed a vicarious expert industry expertise industry thriving on the intellectual labor of people of color but the bounties of which i would say are only available uh, normally to white western scholars with access to resources funding and publications right so when I say the expert industry, what do I mean? And and please bear with me because these experiences are are personal. As I said, it may not. I I'm not I'm not drawing general conclusions out of here. Just sharing with you this this expert industry that I have witnessed working in different parts of the global north, UK, Ireland, Australia. Now working in Sweden, I've observed how expertise on Asia, Africa, Latin America is commonly attributed to and claimed by white scholars, you know, that, that sense of owning areas of research. That expertise is not only about having undertaken some kind of field visit in these locations to study the people and politics, which of course a lot of our colleagues are doing and a lot of good work is coming out. But it also includes, you know, uh, claims about intimate and very authoritative knowledge about those sites. And some key indicators of this expertise, uh, uh, you know, which is easily determined by Western location and white privilege let me give you some some examples you know a short visit suffices to claim expert knowledge and insights you can go for four days you come back touristy travels maybe and that you can you can produce regional and local expertise in some cases and this expertise gets wider attention and legitimacy through media appearances and write-ups right you may not have even spent that much time in the field but you become you know the the voice Research funding and resources are mostly controlled by global north institutions and sites of expertise, case studies can change if lucrative areas of funding emerge. So, you know, the relationship of funding and research is interesting. So if today funding bodies want to say we want to work on Asia or India, well, let's see what the pandemic has done to India. Everyone will run there rushing to India. But then if it's Africa, then we are like, OK, overnight we our expertise shifts. And that's something to think about. Right. Uh, so you may not, and the other point is, uh, you may not even, uh, you know, even tacit support by a white group translates into a very unfair advantage for funding applicants against those who are from non-white context. And I know this is still work in progress. Funding bodies are work in progress. But for those of us who work on it, with it, on, you know, with funding bodies, this is something to think about. You may not be uh, trained in the subject matter, but you become the sought after expert on that subject and more. And this has happened so many times that I witnessed you know you can be a linguist or a cultural theorist you may not know anything about politics or political history but you become the commentator on the domestic and foreign policy aspects and you know your which which may have which have little to do with your knowledge of say a certain language 
right? Or a certain uh, cultural aspect of that society or religion, but then you become the go-to person. And I think that's also something that I've watched. So white privilege implies that your analysis is considered more credible and legitimate as against a body of work produced by a local scholar or agency that may be intellectually more rigorous and representative of those, uh, you know, local conditions and voices. So even on subject matters that require those voices and those lived experiences and skill, an intellectual assessment from a white Western expert is treated as authoritative, even if it does not speak to the empirical evidence. And I would say to you here, the dilemma is that if you get these opportunities and you're not the expert, then there is an ethical call that you have to take, right? And that I don't believe that all of us end up doing that. So the case study then is formulated through methodology logical insights from participant observation, field archives, we know all of that interviews. But the entire empirical study, right, everything that we've collected becomes a case of knowledge predetermined through frameworks that we have already decided. And the, the frameworks are often quite Western. And this is a repeated problem that we are watching with many, many conflicts that we study. We are not doing enough to uh, see you know what what local knowledge holds for us to analyze things better and most significantly the data the process of data gathering and doing field work in the global south can reveal how racialized identities and hierarchies are imposed and how biases work right uh, it's it's not and whiteness is not obviously about white bodies that i'm talking about but also how researchers and the researched perceive each other construct a knowledge space where legitimacy and authority are constantly constantly negotiated and we see that happening. Uh, the language of fieldwork, for example, I would say is also mired in colonial uh, logic and practices, right? Um, it, it, often the saving mission. I, I told you the example of one, uh, one uh, episode, right, where uh, research subjects are backward, poor, violent, all of that. But, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, it's also that you are, uh, you know, if you work with, with, with such people who have these ideas, it's very difficult to come out of that and not, uh, you know, critique the colonial logics of doing this kind of work. I told you, I, I never forgot this from this researcher. Now I return to civilization. So it's okay to go to some part of the dark, dreary world and come out with some facts and then say that, you know, conflict exists because of these reasons. These are actually real lived experiences. I don't have much time, but, you know, this is important to consider. And of course, linked to the first point itself about brokers is the fact that brokers, assistants, research subjects, you know, all are invisibilized, diminished and erased or figure in acknowledgements or footnotes of academic research outputs and publications. The entire experience of field research is based on local collaborations, uh, but it can hardly be grasped from the publication credits and authorship attributed to the West and researcher. I know of people who have uh, hardly even been to the field, probably just the plane landed and they took another flight and they are now, you know, writing with, with expertise knowledge. So I think these things are very real that we need to pay attention to. Of course, as I said, underpayment to local collaborators and exploitative contracts, you know, we get a lot of money from these uh, funding agencies, but uh, how do we um, how do we use that money? I remember once working in, uh, in an Asian country, uh, uh, you know, in, when I was working at the university in Australia, and uh, in, in one of the field sites, uh, the problem was that we had contracted the researchers there and I was with a colleague and we hadn't paid them. There were some delays in the payment. And uh, uh, I remember that our local hosts were, you know, paying for our meals and it made me really uncomfortable. So I began to pay my money and my colleague said, you know what, it doesn't matter. We will, of course, pay them and they will have never seen this money in their lives. So don't worry. You know, so I'm just telling you that these are very real experiences of how we treat people. Uh, uh, so, and, and of course, the count, there are counter narratives, right? But they are silenced due to the fear of losing foreign funding, right? That's also a concern that some of these researchers have. Credit taking, citation politics, and publishing access are heavily influenced by, uh, you know, this kind of gate gatekeeping and racialized thinking. It is well known that uh, Global South researchers are cited less. Forget about, you know, Global South research assistants or even uh, brokers. Um, and so in our project, we are actually saying that you need to have these conversations with brokers and if they are, if they want a voice, because writing, you know, getting data and simply writing in good language 
language and sending it to the right publisher doesn't constitute a publication. It means that we are still invisibilizing those who collected that data, who've spent time working with us on our ideas. So it has to be on equal footing to ask them whether they would be interested in collaborating at a different level. How would they like to be represented? Those conversations we don't have. We think the job is done and we just move on, right? So then finally, I know there's not a lot of time left. Let me uh, highlight the ethical dilemmas, right? Challenges and also opportunities of doing research and what are clearly very anxiety filled times for us. Uh, socially distant times, you know, human to human contact is less, but how are we thinking about this, right? Now here, I, I find it interesting because I talk to a lot of colleagues and students who are, you know, who are all doing research and they're like, okay, field work is affected. But the first questions are, is our research actually focused on after effects of COVID, uh, like migrant workers, families who've lost members, uh, who've suffered damages, social systems, medical infrastructure, or political decision making? Are we actually uh, investigating COVID? Or is our uh, something related to COVID? Or is, it, is our research focused on other aspects, such as my own research on famines in the past or environment or climate justice, uh, various aspects of ongoing conflict. So I think that distinction has to be made. Everything is not affected by COVID in the way that we have said, okay, COVID, COVID. But there is some research that we do which is not connected to the pandemic. Of course, it's impacted, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not affected. And here I do recognize that, as I said, there's no COVID free pandemic free research, people and societies are affected. But this distinction helps us adopt a certain sensitivity that has become essential, right? If you want to do research on famine, you will be less uh, worried about these things. But if you're working on migrant workers, who've lost jobs, you have to have a different sensitivity, right? So trauma of these people is very raw. Redressal and justice is impossible and entire social systems are broken in many parts of the world. So we have to retool. And, and it's not just COVID. With COVID are linked many things. You know, how did the situation come to that? The broken healthcare systems or what will uh, what happens to, uh, you know, um, social security? How are, uh, you know, uh, local businesses dying? You know, what happens to migrant workers? So there are all those related issues. So we have to retool our sensitivity thinking about who or what we want to research on. Uh, so what then are my experiences very quickly collaborations and contacts with local researchers for me personally have increased and I know to, with, with a lot of you as well. I'm also working on another project on sexual violence uh, in the war and peace continuum and we're looking at India and Congo as two sites each two sites each within these countries and we are working with local teams who are actually collecting data for us and I'm working with the team in India and we have regular meetings, we exchange data. It's a, it's a different kind of dynamic that you find in some sense that you know, there's a the research has been democratized where local researchers feel like they have a say. And I and I've had these conversations with colleagues in India and, you know, who are involved in the project. They they are collecting data. They're working with local researchers. You know, these meetings that we have online, all of this has been remarkable. Uh, you know, instead of us going to those sites, doing our fieldwork and coming back, this kind of uh, give and take has been really, uh, in some sense, community building of a different level. Um, and also for the projects that require archival material on my project where I've been unable to go you know I have been able to hire uh, research assistants on the ground who have you know who have done a remarkable job so it's also creating opportunities to get to know more people and get for, get uh, to work with them and of course we have improvised interview communication tools you know all of that but I do want to point out that uh, digital divide is enormous irrespective of uh, us claiming that let's do a Skype interview and zoom I mean education uh, also has been so difficult in parts of the world I mean we just take these things for granted but it's a it's a big task to actually uh, you know demand that you know people have access to internet it's not very easy uh, nature of research data has changed also. So for some of us who thought that methodologically it made sense to do interviews, we are thinking whether we can actually uh, do focus groups or perhaps look to some archives, look to some media, you know, so we have had to change those strategies. And I would say that it's not been a huge loss in that sense. It's a, it has made us think a little bit creatively. What are the specific challenges? 
Access has become and will become difficult and restricted even for local people. Those that I have worked with and we have tried to do workshops and interviews last year, uh, there was a trend even before Corona that field sites were becoming restricted. And we, we in fact started on this project on brokers before uh, the pandemic hit. And our point was that we are not go going to be able to access the field as and when we feel like, you know, there, there are issues of environment, there are issues of flying to wherever we feel like, spending that time in the field, family concerns. Uh, and also many governments are anxious, you know, of of researchers who are entering field sites without adequate permission you know post-colonial governments have their own anxieties and and research fatigue has set in so that's something important to remember there's also a strong misperception about research whether you know at, at this point of time i would say things are so raw that there's a lot of suspicion about doctors nurses vaccine volunteers any anyone who is outside the community right people are having these anxieties about any inquiry that is being made i can and i speak definitely from from my work on india that you know people don't enjoy talking to foreigners in fact there was a time when non-resident indians like myself who lived abroad and went to india we were like celebrities in our local in our localities that you know we stay in foreign countries now nobody wants to talk to us in fact they've been during corona when plane loads of people went back they were they were locked up and there was a lot of community anxiety around foreign bodies we became the foreign bodies so that's really interesting how researchers also fall into that rich privileged uh, you know uh, class of people who are who've come here to just find out how we're doing so i think we have to be sensitive and also there have been tremendous examples i mean most recent there was an example of a very well-known historian um, uh, who you know Scottish historian who writes enormously on India lives in India but then he uh, unfortunate uh, post that he wrote on social media was that oh when the plague struck of course the pandemic became the plague because any third world country always has plague so he writes when the plague struck I you know I decided to use the Sri Lanka India air bubble and he, I kind of um, I escaped with uh, my family just as the you know the, the worker in the farmhouse had fallen ill and so he has workers who are looking after him who are ill but he meanwhile avails of uh, the air bubble escapes to Sri Lanka clicks a picture of the resort where he was staying and then puts it up saying and he calls it the great escape and this is a man who has made a career by living and selling books to India I have paid thousands of rupees to buy his books I'm regretting it but I'm just telling you that you know the credibility one we are a community if somebody does that it, it becomes a you know it becomes a thing for others and I know that uh, time is running out but I did want to say there's a lot more emotional labor that is involved when we when we are uh, going to go back to the field as we even talk to people online uh, people are struggling with debts and loss and you know all sorts of things so that emotional labor is not just of them and from them but also from us uh, we are affected we are we have to do a lot more of that labor also we can't take it for granted that it's only them who are affected we're all fine no i get very affected too you know we all have families and uh, you know all sorts of suffering okay so very quickly then uh, uh, conventional field work will have to be uh, thought through uh, and optimistically maybe next year we can all go back and see how travel assumes but we I mean it's still a situation where we don't know human to human interaction based research will decline I have heard my colleagues say that because of the environment they may consider even taking planes and going and doing this kind of research for sustained periods of time so I think we'll have to think about conventional field work uh, and also social norms have changed right in the in the pandemic how people are mourning norms of sanitization hygiene and all lot of uh, this has created its own divide there's a lot of trust deficit and you know obviously uh, that we've talked about you know the the loss of credibility right uh, so in some sense uh, uh, so that's important conventional field work also keeping the focus that suffering is not just through corona there are other ways in which people are still suffering and their connections to be made there research has to be decolonized as i said building partnerships are important and not not just individual partners I would say institutional partners are extremely important so and that requires research so if you ask me what should we do the first thing we should do is look for the right partners when we do this research right so uh, and they are institutions they can be 
the NGOs, we can work through universities. We have to kind of get creative in this field and, and that requires a different kind of research, right? I often notice that we have these partnership funding for building partnerships. I think we need to use those more creatively. There's also a risk of unethical research that will increase. Uh, non-verifiable data and narrative peddling, that will also happen. And I think colleagues have written about it. I think that's also we must keep in mind. Uh, of course, I talked about the digital divide, which will uh, stop people from doing what they have to. But my very final point is that, uh, 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 of course, and, and as I said, case study theory model, that also must change. That, oh, I have a theory from here, but I can go to uh, uh, DRC or I can go to uh, wherever, Burundi, and I can, I can apply it. I think there needs to be some more thinking about that but very finally all of us gathered here part of different institutions you know whether as, as academics or practitioners we have to really think about the ethical scrutiny required to democratize research and by that i mean funding agencies ethics boards research institutions they all need to ask questions about the role and situation of facilitating researchers right such institutions have to demand details about how we do research you know these are questions when we review journals for example we don't ask you know how how was this data collected? And we need to ask those questions when we sit on those boards, uh, you know, funding agencies, when we sit uh, as journal reviewers and academic publishers, they should have, they should be pushed for greater responsibility. For those of us who are part of uh, book series or journal editors, we should demand that every article or publication, we should ask, how did you collect? Whose voices? And perhaps even get letters that, you know, this, I was involved in the project and I don't want my name there or not. I mean, we have to think through these mechanisms mechanisms, right? And finally, very uh, while history demonstrates that change requires much more than just uh, consciousness, uh, you know, of individual people, we must not lose sight of the roles that we play. As, as I said, we all have to make more choices in, 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 the, in, in doing research in the future. Those choices, those ethical choices, we will have to make even as we reinvent the ethical, uh, you know, considerations of research, we have to make those choices. Am I the right fit? Is this the right country? Are these the right people? Is this how I want to? Uh, and I think it's a good conversation that we've already started in many circles. I think we are on a roll for the last two years, three years. I've seen so many conversations on ethics I've been part of. So I think we're doing well. We just need to be uh, a little bit more conscious and a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, conversational, find out more from other people's experiences. So let me stop here and thank you, Nina, for the time and opportunity. Well, thank you for a wonderful, thought-provoking and very comprehensive uh, talk on a lot of dilemmas that all of us doing research are facing, were facing before the pandemic, uh, and now with the pandemic have been hopefully forced to, to uh, take more seriously into account. Uh, I should say now to all the attendant, uh, attendees that uh, this is the moment where you start writing your comments, uh, suggestions, or direct questions to uh, uh, Swati Parasha in the Q and A function. I have a few um, uh, discussion themes that that I will start out with, and as soon as we finish on those, I will uh, go into the. Uh, Q and A uh, field in 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 the screen and uh, convey your 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 questions and comments. Now you are very wary of not talking about ideal practices uh, because as soon as we go there, uh, we are sort of also constraining ourselves and we might end up. Uh, in another uh, uh, blind street. Uh, still, I wonder when I, I sort of hear your very uh, uh, pertinent critique, what would be the ideal cooperation practice uh, apart from acknowledging uh, contributors uh, to various stages of, of the research, the co-authorship, the citation policy, uh, the informed cons consent of, of people uh, participating with, with their experiences. You 
ended by saying that uh, ethic boards, researchers on, on councils uh, have a large responsibility, but that's also what many of us perhaps fear, uh, that ethics boards become just another uh, constraining jacket that you can't go, you can't do, that we create all these no-go zones that those of us who have no, worked under such circumstances know it's not as dangerous as, as perceived as not, you know. So I, I, I see a dilemma here uh, in what, what, what is really the ideal practices and how do we uh, decolonize our practices while at the same time not uh, producing new straight jackets. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Nina. Uh, very then uh, aware that other people may have questions as well. I think it's uh, wonderful that we are reflecting on this. One of the co contributors, right, to, to think about what are I'm I'm very of ideal practices because we use the language of best practices and expertise, right, uh, very uh, loosely, and uh, those are generally coming from a certain uh, vantage point, which is quite problematic in my view. For example, again, I have written uh, some work, not a lot, but I have done some work on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, and I have critiqued it, saying that you know whose agenda how do we think about best practices which are just sort of you know inflicted on other parts of the world and i am a bit wary of that language uh, having said that uh, it is not just that we start paying them better and we just start recognizing them and perhaps instead of uh, footnoting them perhaps mention them in bold in the acknowledgements i think those are just token i think we need those very detailed conversations about contractual obligations that we have and uh, you know and and what the payment ought to be, you know, uh, for example, insurance cover, we, we have enormous data now available that the people who are doing work in the field put themselves through risk. And because their jobs are precarious, there's no money, there are people ready to do jobs for cheap price. We, we get, for example, uh, if you get a certain amount of money to do field work, you economize because you can and you don't pay the person because you think, you know, you don't need to uh, give that much money. I think those are uh, absolutely uh, they need uh, guidelines through which we can uh, you know work on on these and fulfill our uh, contractual obligations to remove the precarity that exists around uh, research. So that's one thing, of course, the, and that that means better logistics, better awareness. But the other thing is that conversation about how we include them. And, uh, you know, as I said that um, in our own project, we have made it very clear to our local partners that if they want to be uh, seen as co-authors, we are happy to include them. You know, if, uh, nobody would reject that. It would also be uh, useful for some of their own careers if they want to be. And it's a matter of choice. Many of them may not even want to be. This is a conversation to be had. Very rarely do we find co-authorship between, uh, you know, a research broker or, or a facilitator or a research assistant. And it's, uh, you know, it's it's a very exploitative situation. So that's another way to decolonize. And, and also the knowledge that we produce, right? As I said, this hierarchy is so rampant. I mean, in every place that I've worked, I know that the moment students come and say, OK, this is my theoretical framework, I've got uh, Galtung figured out, I'm doing, you know, yes, structural violence, where is it? OK, I'm going to Burundi, I'm going to uh, South Africa, you know, and that's where I'll see if Galtung fits there. I know that uh, for most of us here, probably I see many of my wonderful colleagues here whose work I really admire, but I'm sure we don't do it. But this is what our students are doing and following this model. And this has to be broken. This idea that you just absolutely must go to a global south country to validate yourself as a good researcher. Good knowledge is not just traversing some part of uh, global south to become, you know, ideas, we are operating in terms of ideas. So we have to be a bit more creative on that front. And the other important question about ethics boards. So, you know, I've had very uh, interesting experiences of working with very stringent ethics boards, which we did in Australia, uh, where, uh, but again, uh, and, and the UK, but then it's also interesting because these ethics board, as you point out, 
not have very limited knowledge of the local context. They go by the foreign ministry directives of security and uh, you know dangers. Uh, I remember they used to tell me uh, that um, sometimes, and I'm not disclosing here any names, but I was told that, okay, you can't go to these, these sites. For example, the ethics boards would tell you, you can't go to, uh, you know, uh, New Delhi, for example. So I would say, I, I the, in order to navigate that, because I do know I can, as an adult, I can make that decision for myself, and I know I'd be okay. I would say, uh, yes, I'm not going to Delhi. I'm only going to India, and they would say, okay, that's fine. So I'm just trying to tell you that they are not very clever. They are not very imaginative in how ethics. Um, you know, you have to sometimes, and this is something I always say to students as well. You have to navigate ethics boards through some unethical uh, pathways as well, in mm -hmm. order to, in order for the for that to make sense, in order for you to do your work, you have to be unethical. And you know what I mean. I don't mean like unethical mm. in the way. But mm. you know, so so what I'm saying is that we can't. But at the same time, I would say we can't do away with them because then there will be no accountability. And the reason why I said I've had different experiences is here and also now in Sweden where we don't go through. You know, and it's peculiar in Sweden. If I'm right, uh, with my own colleagues, I see if you work in Sweden, if you do research in Sweden, you need ethics clearance. But if you are working outside Sweden, you don't need it. And of course, in America and other places you need because the university is worried that you're going, you know, it, it is going to be sued by somebody. So they need ethics. So I think ethics, the purpose of the ethics board has not always aligned with, uh, you know, the interest of the researchers and to protect good quality research. It's always to protect institutions and mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. So I think we have, I'm not saying do away with them think about how we can uh, demand greater accountability. And by mm -hmm. that, I just don't mean boards. I also mean funding agencies. And now I know Swedish Research Council, for example, asks more questions about methodology. Earlier, you could just say, I have worked in Lebanon for 20 years. You know, I know everyone there and I do research. And those applications were getting funded also. But now everywhere, I mean, not just in uh, Sweden or Denmark, but everywhere. Now they are asking questions and, and the boards have diversified. They are also so people from Global South sitting on these funding boards, right? And of course, uh, academic publishers who also need to ask those questions, us as reviewers. Yeah, thank you. So it's going in the right direction. That's good to know. Yeah. And, we can, and we can also sort of creatively um, navigate this space. I just have one more uh, yeah. short uh, question before I, I uh, go to, to, to a, a list of, of questions I have on the screen. Uh, you were talking about uh, the expert industry, which I found uh, really intriguing. And you were pointing to the fact that academics now also become experts because we are uh, actively participating in the mass media and the dangers of that. Yeah. My problem here is that it is also demanded. I mean, by funding agencies, by our institutions, there's an increasing pressure to be available. Uh, also, here the argument is almost similar that we need to democratize uh, knowledge and one way of doing that is to be available uh, for the media. Uh, but that again co-creates this uh, expert industry. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, of course, um, I agree with you that there's a lot of pressure everyone wants, you know, it's a re research is a commercial activity. Let's not forget that, you know, we are funded, we're giving given tons of money to do it and resources. It's, of course, it's commercial, we have to be in the market, we have to, I mean, don't they ask us like, how would you market your is this as if it's some uh, pieces of carrot that we've just collected from the garden. But you know, they tell us to write in that language. It is problematic, but we have to be part of it in order to change things as well and i think uh, i'm not saying that we have to be averse to the media i have been uh, you know quite involved in media commentaries and i'm always uh, quite engaged in what uh, as public intellectuals what we uh, what we uh, say and how we convey but i think uh, all i'm saying is that are we always the right people i mean you see the same people again and again being invited you know media also works on that logic that it has created certain academics it requires academics and it you know we, Unless we say, if somebody asks me, for example, would you like to talk about Bangladesh, right? I work on South Asia loosely, but mostly on India, Pakistan, little bit Sri Lanka. Am I the expert on Bangladesh uh, next elections? I'm not. 
So I will say no, although you think that I might be because I'm from the region. I think there's somebody else that I know that who might do a better job. I think those are decisions that we have to take. And I think people also buy this, that the more media presence that you have, you know, social media followers, that you will be called a better researcher and you will have visibility. You know, this is, again, very personal and feel free to disagree. You don't, I mean, good research does not require uh, this kind of, you know, overt media publicity. Good research manages to find its way way out. So I would say democratization means being conscious of our own decisions, of where mm -hmm. we want to go, who we want to speak to, and uh, not wanting to speak to as well. You know, all media is not good media, right? And, and related to that one quick point, also wanted to say writing has democratized. We are no longer looking at conventional academic pieces as the only way in which you can present fieldwork findings. Blogs, of course, are one, but essays are being written. There are photo essays, there are a narrative. I mean, there's so many journals now. I'm also in charge of a series, book series called Creative Interventions in Global Politics. We ask for poetry or artwork or collage or whatever that be. I mean expression of that research output has changed and so you said what's changing good things are happening i think we just need to tap into it right yeah thanks well thank you so much i will now uh, try to moderate uh, a virtual discussion with uh, written questions uh, in the in the q a uh, field of 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 uh, of this uh, webinar so one attendee who is anonymous would like you to uh, define the role of the research brokers. Uh, another one uh, would like you to elaborate on how uh, gender plays out in the hierarchies of research. That's Iris uh, Ilya. And I thought maybe you could put these two together. Yeah, of course. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh, how do you define the role of the research broker? So for that, I think a quick answer would be for you to look at our, um, you know, the special issue that we did with civil wars, uh, Maria uh, Eriksson Baz and Mats Hutus, uh, you know, did uh, were the editors and I have a excuse me, a paper in it. And um, we talked about various roles. I mean, again, uh, we also pointed out my own paper in that points out that it's actually very um, uh, hard for uh, us to pinpoint that, you know, research brokers is even the right word, you know, in many places, for example, I argued in the case of India, we don't want to use the word brokers. Yeah, so we didn't want to use the word brokers there. We said, uh, or fixers for that matter. We were also worried that some places fixers was okay, but we said, you know, it's not a broker, brokerage is not a nice word in many contexts. So we said, if, if we kept it loosely uh, aligned to people who are the gatekeepers, who are facilitators, through whom you gain access to the field, gain contacts, who may also be actual brokers of the conflict you're trying to study. That might also be possible. So. So they do a variety of roles and research assistants are only part of the deal. But these are people who also arrange for you to, you know, travel. They make logistical arrangements for you if you want to uh, go to particular sites or even access to research participants that some of us have had. I had brokers in Sri Lanka who allowed me uh, access to Tamil uh, Tiger militants that I, uh, women that I wanted to interview long years ago. So I think that that is important to think through uh, a whole variety of roles that they do but more importantly the points person and the related question is how do you choose research brokers often i get asked that how do we how do i find a research broker who's ethical who's good that's a hard one i mean normally uh, there there is again uh, you know research uh, if it is a hyper uh, visibilized area of research you will always find people who have done that work before and you can go and uh, work with them but uh, even finding a broker is is challenging you don't just end up and somebody is there you have to do some research in terms of who's who's done work with previous researchers and there's always the question of fatigue and all of that right so a variety of roles that they do I would say most importantly as gatekeepers and facilitators the other question was about gender of course gender is absolutely critical I mean it's it's even the, the whole language of field work is gendered how how the uh, you know the theory case study divide occurs is also very gendered there's a kind of masculine imposition on those sites where we find these people whose lives we 
can talk about pretty much like how we talk about women and minorities, their 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 bodies and their lives, and we always have grand theory. So so there's this hierarchical way in which we do research that is gendered. But apart from that ourselves as gendered bodies when we are you know moving in the field uh, it it is a gendered experience and again it varies i mean there has been instances where women working in the field again well documented who've had uh, you know researchers who have had um, you know um, uh, who who've been subjected to sexual abuse or who've been you know who've had to go through uh, those kinds of uncomfortable moments because they are certain kinds of gendered bodies and it it, it is the other way around as well i mean research brokers mostly we we found that at least in the cases that we studied were mostly men so what happens to women you know why are women are women doing brokerage you know are there women in universities or uh, students or journalists who come out and say okay you know we want to help out these researchers what happens to the their pay what are the family dynamics it's an incredibly gendered uh, project and as i said even uh, the experience of me working with a british journalist was gendered because here i was this brown woman from that area vis-a-vis uh, -vis compare i mean i was power, i was a lecturer then i technically had more power as did my african colleague who was also a lecturer then but our students phd students who were white and male had more power than us so it's it's very gendered in how it plays out there's a lot more reflections on that yes um, yes thank you uh, lisa ritchie a good colleague of mine yes um thank you for your uh, presentation but she also asked how we as researchers ask the responsibilizing questions that you uh, suggested at the end of your talk about the data behind articles and, and proposals, those we review. Because there is a considerable variation across disciplines over the acceptability of relying on the vicarious expertise industry. So she asks, could a code of conduct be one possibility here? Hi, Lisa. Of course, we uh, I know a few and obviously we are uh, connected in the wider universe of the work that we do. Um, but uh, uh, I, I would say, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, we have to think even if it is not there, we have to think about it. And I just wanted to point out since you mentioned I use that vicarious expertise industry, it sticks to me because my frustration is that even critical, uh, you know, academic uh, um, fields uh, are now thriving on this expertise industry. That has been my frustration with what I call statist feminism, which wants to interrogate uh, gender and peace and security and everything that uh, from a very statist uh, funding agency perspective. And uh, again, it's a, it's a mushrooming, it's, it's, it's an expertise, you know, gender experts. That language really is uh, troubling. And I also see that, uh, that kind of discussion even within uh, post-colonial circles. I think the whole idea of canon building is also a part of it every subfield or every field of inquiry wants to thrive on you know the, this idea of the expert so it is really troubling so uh, th there are variations across discipline but i think we need to we need to really talk a little bit about this code of conduct which may not be universalized again but how we can make it work in in many different contexts i know these are conversations that are ongoing and i'm sure you're part of many i don't think i have a specific uh, you know kind of response to this except that we're thinking about it and i think uh, these questions are being asked you know that is uh, what i find interesting that people are asking these questions that okay uh, I, I as a reviewer do it and i know others do it as well like how is the empirical the methodology i mean people would write a little bit and you know okay in a journal article you're not expected to write that much or even in a proposal now there are questions that are coming through so perhaps we can think about how we can you know work around that yeah but we'll talk more lisa and i'm sure at other <laughs> forum thank you so uh, we have two more questions and eight minutes to go um, so one is from uh, my colleague alam uh, jimlavi who is curious about your point on Global South researchers based in the Global North when you go back to the field as a native, as a PhD with a minority background, already navigating several intersecting hierarchies. So she asks, what suggestions do you propose for decolonial collaborations when going to the field considered both native and or foreigner, if any? 
such a big question. We could write a collaborative paper on that. Can't answer it straight away here. But uh, numerous things. I mean, firstly, in, in what my experience is, to be aware of that privilege. You know, when I go to the field, I know I'm not just a, a person, you know, a student. I also embody certain privileges of having had this very middle class, you know, educational background. I speak English, knowing the language, uh, English in the way that I do, I speak is, is a matter of privilege. So just a little bit awareness of that. and. and and then it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop where we say, okay, I have privilege. How do I then navigate the field? Well, the point is privilege doesn't stop us from, uh, you know, it's, 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 it can't be a conversation stopper. We have to see ways in which it can open conversations, open doors for other people. Uh, and at least in my own work, I'm very mindful of that, that whatever I have achieved, I mean, is it possible that, uh, you know, that uh, the way in which doors were open for me, can I do something uh, in, 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 as, as a matter of community? It's not a it's not it's not that you do something for people it's what you have to do because this is how we have to uh, thrive uh, so uh, in terms of going to the field uh, as both an, a native and or uh, a foreigner that's a really tough challenge because uh, as much as you think that you are struggling with these performances you know people in the field are very smart I think one of the better pieces that I have written is an article called uh, how do war and war bodies understand international relations and I like that piece because it really made me think and I was fresh out of my field work and I it made me realize and I had worked in Kashmir where you know I was the outsider in a way technically because of course there is the Indian issue of uh, Indian presence in in Kashmir and uh, the military presence and the conflict the history of the conflict and I was carrying an Indian passport but at the same time so I came from the enemy state but I'm also the uh, foreigner because I'm based in England as a student I go there and you know th those interactions were interesting and then Sri Lanka but the the thing that I learned is that it's it's uh, it's again they are judging you, they are giving you information based on uh, their own assessment of you. So it's not just we performing. It's a field work is a gamut of performances. They are the people there are also very smart. They ask very smart questions, and I think that is why even when we do that research, it's important to filter our findings back to people and back to the communities. That's another thing very important that doesn't happen. How do we keep Keep those conversations going with the people about whom we write. I think it's a. Uh, I think this collab uh, decolonial collaboration has to be well thought out in terms of our own role, our own privilege. It can't be that we sit here and say, "Oh, you know, I'm I am I am the global South uh, person of color here." I also have certain responsibility of decolonizing my own, you know, context, my own setup. What kinds of class, caste, religious privileges do I embody when I go back? How do I throw that around? Uh, you know, so so it's it's a little bit complex, I would say, and it's it's an ongoing con. A lot of reflection on that. IR scholars have may not have done it. I know it's been it's been thought about. You know, how do you become this? How do you go back to native, uh, yeah, native places for research? Yeah, Nina, to be thank, thank you, thank you. There's one more uh, last and very big uh, question that. Um, is, Thank you also, of course, for your presentation and the many uh, important issues you have brought up. Um, uh, this person, Tina Seppala, a colleague, yeah. would like um, um, to hear your thoughts on what kind of new challenges as well as opportunities the ongoing pandemic has, in your view, brought about for rethinking and transforming our activist, neoliberal and colonial research practices. And she acknowledges that you have already talked about some, but yeah. Yeah. she would, if you could, yeah. uh, really like you to address uh, some more, if you could. Yeah, I'll be very brief, Tina. Hi, Tina. We know, of course, know each other. Um, yes, um, you know, I'm thinking of um, uh, what else uh, ongoing conversation but i'm reminded of veena das you know the anthropologist who's uh, so so well right, written so beautifully and so well on violence she was there at our department just last week and it was a wonderful conversation between her and kimberly hutchings on violence how do we understand violence and one of the things if you read veena's works she says very clearly that you know it's it's to imagine that you're outside violence that you can end pain and you can be situated somewhere outside that's that's not something it's a complex web it's in which you are entangled and it's very hard to get out of it. So I would say this extractive neoliberal, good for us to use those words, which we do all the time, racialized. But I wonder if we are ever going to be 
out of it. All we are saying is that, uh, in fact, just just funded research, if you ask me, is extract extractivist and neoliberal because our colleagues don't get the funding. Their their jobs are at stake. They're you know they they do it. They get tons of uh, what do you call teaching piled up on them or admin because they haven't got funding that itself is hierarchy to start with and and a primary purpose of universities was teaching and sharing of ideas and somehow we have become you know this this space of just who gets the funding and the big pot of funding to do research i remember this conversation with uh, indian uh, uh, scholar post colonial very uh, uh, well known scholar ashish nandi uh, i worked with him for a year in csds where he was uh, the mentor and, and the big professor, uh, interesting conversations, he would say things like, why are you all applying for research funds half the time? We used our own salary to do research. So we had to tell him that was another er era. But you know, some of the best works, collaborative works between him and Veena Das and the partition and etc. came out through those efforts. So I think we have neoliberalized the whole idea of funded research in any case. People ask me, I, I didn't have funding for long periods of time, but I still was productive. I was still writing things that I was interested in. And of course, also self-funding. So I think we have to think about many, many questions there. But I also quickly um, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, respond to the question of Suzanne Zwingel. I think we missed that. It's right at the top. In light of the challenges, is it OK if I read yes, this? Now? Yes. In the light of the challenges of going to the field in the global south, what do you think about researching global or transnational dynamics in the context where we live? Uh, global or transnational? Okay, I find this intriguing, but often feel such research is not recognized as fitting into IR as international. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, IR has, and hi, Suzanne, good to see that you could join us. Um, uh, the, the point is precisely this, that only in the last 20 years, or perhaps you would have a different understanding that IR has started recognizing that we need to do fieldwork. But fieldwork has become fetishized now, even within our own feminist circles. It's as if all the knowledge of uh, anything will come only if we go out there and uh, go with our whole baggage of uh, theoretical formulations and impose. I think uh, we are struggling with it. I think feminism is struggling with it. Suddenly we've run out of ideas. So we are using the same theoretical and this is my uh, grouse also that we need to perhaps even expand our notion of what theory is. Uh, but yes, I mean, the con what is the global? The global is where we live. Exactly the point that you're making, you know, it's in Sweden that you have global communities. You are uh, watching that in the United States, of course, as my friend, you're there. But everywhere, I mean, India is a microcosm of the world too, when I go there and see what happens to black lives there or, you know, other kinds of inequalities and, every and sustainable lives and everything so you know this I and I still say that we are so fixated with nation states right we still think uh, that nation states so I'm going to Rwanda I'm going you know things don't stop at the borders of these countries we are if we have to research people we have to break those uh, borders in our in our minds but also literally the physical borders to to think about reason that's why this is global I mean, to me, every issue that I can analyze, even related to Corona, you know, how the state dealt with it, how people responded, what happened with the hospitals, I can do it all here. So as I said, this this breaking this binary hierarchy that the field is out there and the knowledge is here and I will superimpose that on. So yeah, brief response, but we will keep talking. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Swati. Thank you all attendees and especially those of you who post these uh, very interesting and, and, and eye-opening, ear-opening, mind-opening questions. And uh, my apologies to Suzanne Swinkle for having missed a question on the top. It didn't appear on my screen, but here uh, uh, Swati was uh, more awake than I was. <sighs> This has been a wonderful series of seminars where we started out uh, by discussing uh, how we as researchers are affected by working in violent um, uh, settings, uh, uh, how we as researchers may internalize uh, trauma, uh, and then ending with this wonderful talk today on how we as researchers can affect the research world. I think that's sort of getting the circle all the way around. Uh, so thank you, Swati, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you to all for 
for participating. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much.